Hello, I'm Defective Detective Theodore from the LAPD and we're investigating the disappearance of a game title called LA Noir, developed by Team Bondi. You wouldn't know anything about that now, would you, Mr. Gold? I want pussy, burger and a cigarette. I need to know what happened, so you're getting nothing until you start talking. And what do you want me to say? Do you want me to lie to you? I can't say that I'm surprised. Especially given how that whole experience began. I mean, let's face it, L.A. Noir was never off to the best of starts. Okay, and what do you know about the startup controversy? You sure you want to know, Detective? Well, buckle up, because this case is a big one. L.A. Noir's story begins in 2006, where a debut trailer would drop for Rockstar's first ever detective action adventure. Or so everyone thought, but in reality, Rockstar was only the publisher in question. The actual developer was a small studio based in Sydney, Australia, by the name of Team Bandai, named after Bandai Beach. The studio had just been acquired by Rockstar Games, as it was recently dropped by Sony. Originally, it was meant to deliver exclusive games for the PlayStation platform, but after evaluating the project as too much of a financial risk, they backed out. The main reason for Sony's concerns were the developer's investment into facial capture technology, creating a brand new studio focused around it and hiring professional actors to portray all of the game's many characters. This increased L.A. Noir's budget costs massively, ruling it as too much of a risk for a potential return on investment. However, one studio who had been known for pushing the bounds of what's possible in the gaming world seems to have found a kindred spirit. Rockstar saw the potential of Team Bandai's vision and decided to take it under their wing, funding its development and marketing costs. This allowed the studio and its employees to relax as they believed the sky was clear and the game was now on steady ground, but they had no idea of the storm that approached them in the background. A storm? What storm? Well, Detective, I'm sure you've heard your fair share of stories of development hells, games going on in circles while the studio is in chaos. This is just another story like it. I don't believe you. Even though there are games with problematic developments, studios don't just vanish. Something else happened here. Okay, let's just say that this particular development hell had a certain individual that not only started it, but was actively throwing gasoline into the fire every chance he got. And although he created hell for his co-workers, he certainly seemed to enjoy it. The man responsible for that hell would be no other than the studio director himself, Brandon McNamara, described by his employees as one of the angriest people in the world, and someone who always wanted things done his way. McNamara had full control over the studio and the project. He had the ability to see himself as a dictator and rule with an iron fist, which is exactly what he did. There's many incidents described where he would scream at his employees in the studio and demand unrealistic deadlines. The studio's attitude at the time was, it's a privilege to work for us, and if you can't hack it, you should leave. This treatment caused employees to be under constant stress, with an extreme crunch culture, requiring many of them to consistently work over time without any financial benefits. In due time, many grew tired and frustrated with their treatment from upper management, causing a mass exodus from the project. In response, Team Bandai would look to the many Australian colleges that taught game design and hire brand new developers fresh from them. By doing so, they could get away with paying them half the salary of a regular employee while forcing them to do twice the work. 
However, despite that plan, the studio was still extremely toxic in its environment. Many employees would have to take on multiple positions at the same time because of developers who quit mid-project. It meant they had to spend months just trying to learn how to do new assignments before they were able to actually begin making progress. This caused the game to run around in circles and made its progress move at a glacial pace. In 2008, after Grand Theft Auto 4 was finished, Rockstar couldn't ignore the situation anymore, so they sent out new producers, animators and developers to Team Bandai to try and steady the project, fill the gaps, as well as get it going in a proper direction. However, despite Rockstar's best effort, they weren't able to fill the holes in this ever-increasing sinking ship. Team Bandai's attitude had not changed and the crunch culture only increased as time went on. Even if you left at 7.30pm, you'd get the evil eyes. The crunch was ongoing. Team Bandai's idea to stop out the bleeding of staff and continue overworking its employees was to delay any overtime bonuses for three months after the game came out, meaning that any developer who left the studio during development would not only not receive any money for overtime, but their names would not even be mentioned in the credits of the game. As the years went on, LA Noir missed one milestone after the other. Rockstar grew frustrated, but they were far too deep into their investment to quit. From 2009 to 2011, the developers would go into full overtime, many staying as late as 3pm at night and working on weekends to try and get the game in a finished state. In its entire development, Team Bandai's would change over 100 employees, but come May 17, 2011, the game would finally be ready to release. How could a game with such a turbulent cycle come out finished? Well, it wasn't easy, but say what you know about Brandon McNamara, he was very, very determined. Plus, Rockstar's hard help, it didn't do him any harm. Overall, I would say the game was just okay. Okay? If this game was just okay, we wouldn't be sitting here, now would we? No, this had to be something special. It was a masterpiece. Not only in its facial animations, voice acting and production quality, but also it was something completely different and unique from any game seen before or since. Just look at the release, it speaks for itself. On May 17, 2011, LA Noir would release worldwide. I think it's fair to say the gaming world had never seen a game like it before or since. Facial expressions in a level of quality never seen in games before. Team Bandai's facial capture technology was revolutionary for its time. It meant they had no need for creating animations as they were able to export the actor's facial movements directly into the game. This allowed them to use the brand new never before seen interrogations to their full potential. Players had to deduce whether a character is being truthful or dishonest entirely based on said expressions, something that would have been impossible had the game been done any other way. On top of that, we saw different case folders, depending on the desk our character was assigned to, all came with a different partner and main vehicle, as well as different teams, depending on the lineup. Players would go through traffic, homicide, vice, and arson in that order, all of them bringing their own unique flair and story. The main story was strong enough as it is. It unravels both Cole's current cases and life 
and shows us flashbacks at the end of most cases about him in World War II. In them, we get to find out how Cole became the man he is. It's very similar to the show Arrow in its early seasons, where we get to see Oliver Queen both in his present vigilante persona and how he trained to become that way. All flashbacks are played after the end of cases to avoid breaking immersion. On top of that, the game would have 40 free roam encounters that would take place during the actual investigations, all of them with full cinematic cutscenes and voice acting. There was also a fairly diverse amount of vehicles for players to choose from and recolor to their heart's desire, as well as multiple outfits that could be earned in-game. The game featured a lengthy story with plenty of side characters, with some re-emerging in the strangest of ways. In a gaming world filled with cheap copycats, where every developer is trying to copy someone else's successful formula until it all goes under, LA Noir was a breath of fresh air, something completely unique that could not be compared to any other AAA release at the time or since. It is that uniqueness that allowed it to stand out and sell over 5 million copies in due time, as well as achieve overwhelmingly positive reviews across all platforms. However, despite all of those achievements, the scars from its hellish development cycle were very clear to see. Scars, huh? And what are those scars that you're talking about? Just a few bugs and glitches. No big deal, really. You're lying, Mr. Gold. How can a game go through such major development issues and change of stuff without affecting the final product? Oh yeah, Mr. Defective Detective. What evidence do you have to prove that there were any major issues with this game? How about this Eurogamer article which speaks to multiple desks being removed, with a total of 11 cases between them? How do you explain that, Mr. Gold? LA Noir was a new concept, okay? It's normal when you're making something from scratch, with no prior reference, to have a couple of major issues. Where would you like to begin? For starters, Despite the gorgeous and in-depth facial animations, it was quite obvious that the body animations did not receive the same attention. Because of it, characters would often look like their neck was not attached to the rest of their body. On top of that, its big selling feature, which was the interrogation encounters, had their fair share of issues. In the original LA Noir for PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360, the three options the player had were Truth, Doubt and Lie. You would press Truth when the character appeared honest, Doubt when you think they're being dishonest but you have no proof, and Lie when you know they're being dishonest and have the evidence to prove it. However, the system had a fatal flaw so much so that Rockstar would later rename the options, starting with Truth to Good Cop, Doubt to Bad Cop, and Lie to Accuse. Do you see the fatal flaw? It means that sometimes, even when a person tells you the truth and looks calm and collected, you're still supposed to doubt or bad cop them if you don't like their answer. Other times, you're supposed to good cop them despite them holding back. It makes interrogations a complete clusterfuck, as now you're just rolling the dice and hoping you get it right. The city's traversal is another major problem. Despite being able to set up a waypoint, there is no guiding route to it. And because LA is still a developing city at the time, you often find yourself at closed roads and dead ends, which can be very frustrating. 
Thankfully, you can fast travel most of the time by letting your partner behind the wheel. The city, despite looking nice, is practically a dead open world, caused by both a lack of animations and the facial tech expenses needed for every character you interact with. However, despite the main story and flashbacks being done well, it's not the only story the game's trying to tell. There is another story running alongside our main one, that of Courtney Sheldon and the shady character of Dr. Harlane Fontaine, voiced and acted out by the same actor as Micah Bell. So hopefully now some of you will understand this reference. The story is told by newspapers found on crime scenes, and because they are always found in the middle of cases, they significantly break immersion, as the focus is taken away from the case you're currently working on to focus on a mostly unrelated story before being pulled back into reality. In combination with free roam events occurring during missions, it can slow down cases and break immersion massively. However, there is no bigger issue than the missing cases. When Detective Phelps joins Homicide, it is mentioned that he is promoted from burglary rather than traffic. As stated by the developers themselves, burglary and fraud were two whole departments that the game featured that were removed in the last moment due to running out of time. The game features four departments, meaning that one third of the game's content never made it into the actual release. A massive blow that clearly exposes the game's troubled upbringing. So, the game had some major issues, but still sold millions of copies and had overwhelmingly positive reviews. There must be another reason why Team Bondi disappeared and we never got a sequel. Tell me, detective, do you like when someone pisses on your shoes? No, I do not. Well, guess what? Neither did Rockstar. Despite giving Team Bondi a nearly unlimited budget and sending some of their best staff to work for them, they still couldn't fix their toxic environment and get their studio in order. They might have sold 5 million copies, but Rockstar was hardly starving for a successful franchise, as both Red Dead Redemption and Grand Theft Auto 4 outsold it. Knowing that, there was simply no reason to keep Team Bandai on the payroll, as bad publicity followed them everywhere they went. It's a bit of a shame when you think about it, especially knowing how well their relationship began. In the beginning of Team Bandai and Rockstar's relationship, Rockstar intended to make Team Bandai a fully functional part of their team, with the name of Rockstar Sydney. However, as time went on and they got to know Team Bandai's management and structure better, they had lost all intention of doing so. Rockstar kept the LA Noir copyright and dropped Team Bandai, leaving them on their own for any future projects. The studio would get picked up by George Miller's production company, who were starting to find their way into the live-action genre. He would create KMM, which was the video game portion of his company, and acquired Team Bandai, merging them under their umbrella. Once funding had been established, it was time for Team Bandai to begin work on their official sequel, named The Whore of the Orient, a name that was used as a culturally insensitive reference for the city of Shanghai back in 1936. A bizarre location for a sequel, given the difficulties of depicting such a foreign culture and setting. However, McNamara had no intention of developing the game to be anything less than the quality of L.A. Noir. He wanted to use the same expensive facial recordings with Hollywood actors just like the ones from his previous title. 
But this time around, WB, who are financing the project, had no intention of investing that type of money. So the studio once again found itself looking for publisher support. In 2013, the Australian investment group would fund $200,000 into their project. But compared to Rockstar's $50 million investment for the previous game, it was clear that wouldn't be enough. Failing to find reliable investors, the studio would cancel the project and collapse, with a leaked gameplay demo being the only evidence of the game's actual existence. L.A. Noir's sequel would join Silent Hill as one of gaming's greatest what-ifs. It's kind of sad, to be honest. Yes, but it is also incredibly fascinating. Usually, studios and games are taken down by poor quality and over-monetization. But this is one of those very, very rare cases where a developer is taken down not because of the game they made, but the way in which they made it. A remarkable tale showcasing that the end doesn't always justify the means. Well, you've helped us close this case, and I appreciate that. But I was told that you have knowledge of something even bigger. But of course I do. I know about a rock that is no longer steady. A studio that was once a trailblazer, coming up with brand new concepts and revolutionizing the superhero genre that has now sold its soul, its dignity, its player base, all of it to the devil in order to pander to left-wing activists and sell microtransactions. A betrayal so vile, so horrific, that it will be remembered for generations to come. Do I doubt the studio will be able to last that long? However, if you want to see that story, you have to tune in next week. Until then, this has been Wild Gold, and thank you all so very much for watching.